Hi, welcome back to this Data Science Jojo video tutorial series on time series. In part two, we left it at modeling our data and predicting five timestamps ahead into the future. In part three, we'll evaluate our predictions and see how far off the mark they were to the actual values in our holdout data or in the last five timestamps of our full sample data set. So now we're going to plot actual versus predicted. We're going to get two versions of our time series. So we're going to have all our values with the last five being actual values. And then we're going to overlay the plot with all the values again, but with the last five being predicted values. And we should see some difference between those actual and predicted values and the last five timestamps. So first we're going to read in our entire sample, which includes our last five values as our actual values. And once again, we're going to use pandas's read csv function. We're going to read in our full sample, our entire data set. And once again, we'll use our date time column as our index column. which is the first column, and we'll pass these dates. And we'll use this squeeze option to return a series. Now I want to print the, the row values or the index values um, of the last of our last five values or holdout set, um, as we're going to input these into another series. So the way to get this, we'll just uh, call it index rows values. And we're going to get the last five here for our actual. I'm going to get the index values of these, starting at 19, going to 23, 24, sorry. And we're going to print these out so we can have a look as well. Okay, let's have a look at these. All right, so these values here um, is basically the timestamps for our holdout set. So I'm going to input these into another series with our prediction values. So I'm going to tie our predicted values to each of their timestamps. So another way you can uh, read in a time series is using this series function here. We were wanting to read from a CSV before, but you can do it this way as well. Give it our predicted values. And we're going to create our own index. I'm going to paste in these values here just so you can see the last five timestamps, but you can just feed it that, you know, index for values variable. I'll clean these up a bit. Okay, great. And let's print this just to make sure that it is in the correct format. have a look. Okay, great. So we have our predicted values tied to their timestamps now in a series. Now what we're going to do is append that onto our training set. So we have, as I said, one version of our series with the predicted values and one version with the actual. So let's go ahead and do that. We can comment these out so we no longer need to print them. And I'm just going to print the tail end of this just to make sure it appended onto the end of the, the training set. Okay, let's have a look here. Okay, great. 
So it looks like it um, successfully appended onto uh, the training set here. So now we have a full series with predicted values and a full series with actual. Okay, now let's plot the actual versus predicted. Um, so I'm going to create a plot here. We'll start with our predicted values and I'm just going to plot them in the color of orange. And I'm going to give it a label so I can uh, add a legend later. And I'm going to do the same for actual, obviously. And I'll just color this a different color, so maybe blue. And I'll also give it a label. And I'm also going to create a legend for this so we can differentiate these lines. I'll just place it in the upper left. It's a pretty reasonable location. Okay, let's have a look at our actual versus predicted. See if, we, see if it was way off the mark or not. Okay, so having a look at this, the predicted kind of follows the same kind of general downward pattern as the actual. It's a little quite off the mark here, um, but we can't tell exactly how far off the mark. Uh, so we need to calculate the mean absolute error as a way of seeing how big are these differences between actual and, and predicted. So let's go ahead and do that. So I'll comment these out. It's kind of no longer need them. And we're going to calculate the mean absolute error to evaluate the model and see if there's a big difference between the actual values and the predicted values and average over these. So first of all, we'll get our actual values and our holdout set. And we'll just get the index um, starting at 19, 18, 23. So our last five values of our holdout set. We'll do the same for predicted. Okay, great. Now we're going to basically go through and compare each value. So we're going to take the first actual value and minus the, the first predicted value, and then we'll take the first, uh, the second actual value and minus the second predicted value and so on and so forth. And so we're going to have um, all these values of the differences between the two. We're going to store them in an array called prediction errors. And then at the end of that, we're just going to average over the absolute values to get an, an idea of, you know, the mean absolute error or the overall um, error rates here. So that's this. So for example, you could take the first actual value minus the first predicted value. And we're going to pin that onto our predictions error array. And we want to have a quick look at these differences to see if they're quite big or not. All right, let's have a look at these. going to ah. between tabbing and having four spaces the wall begins <laughs> we'll use four spaces in a sense just make sure that's consistent because um, Python's kind of a language that's kind of has these issues all the time so let's run this again 
Okay, so here are differences between actual and predicted. Uh, so they don't seem too bad. In some cases, they might be quite well off the mark, considering that we have values that go six places after the decimal point. 0 0.2, 0 0.25 might be quite big of a difference. <laughs> um, but the way to really judge this is to average over them, their absolute values. Okay, we'll store it in the variable called mean absolute error and we're going to obviously get the mean first. I'm going to use the statistics package for this. The mean of the absolute values. And that's pretty much it. The absolute values of our prediction errors. And we obviously want to print this, so let's have a look at it. Okay, so our mean absolute error is about uh, 0.02, so it's here. So that basically means that it's off the mark for about 0.02, so it'll, it'll either be under estimating or overestimating um, but considering as I said like there's six values uh, past this decimal point maybe this is quite a big of a difference um, maybe it's it's not too big of a deal um, it's something that we need to consider here uh, you'd have to think of this and, and decide whether you would accept this model as it is there are a few problems to be aware of in this model uh, for one the data might be not entirely stationary. So even though it looked fairly, fairly stationary to our judgment when we were plotting it before, a test would help better determine this. Um, so what we could do is use an augmented Dickey Fuller test uh, to check if those two rounds of differences uh, that we did resulted in a stationary data or not. Um, so let's, let's have a look here and see why we're getting a relatively big mean absolute error. And we're going to print the p-value for this test. So if the p-value is greater than 0 0.05, which is our significance level, we'll accept the null hypothesis as the data is non-stationary. And if it's less than or equal to 0 0.05, we're going to reject that null hypothesis and say that the data is stationary. So if we want it to be stationary, we want to see it less than um, or equal to 0 0.05. Let's see if this is the case. Okay, let's print this and have a look. Okay, so we probably wouldn't accept the model as it is because once it's, it, it's confirmed that we have uh, stationary issues with our data, it's not completely stationary yet. So this could be a reason why it's a bit off the mark. So then we need to look at better transforming these data. One way you could do this is you could look at, say, stabilizing the variance by applying maybe the cube root, which can take into account negative and positive values, and then you can difference the data. You might also want to compare models um, with different AR and MA terms. So remember when we printed the summary of our model and there were some terms that weren't really significant enough to be included in the model? Maybe you look at um, running a model just with one MA term and see if that makes a difference to the results. Uh, also, another thing to consider is uh, this is a very small sample size of only 24 timestamps in our entire data set, 19 in our train set, so there might not be enough data to spare for a holdout set. Um, so then to get more out of your data for training, you could look at rolling over time series or timestamps at a time for different holdout sets. And this allows you to train on more timestamps. So it doesn't stop the model from capturing the last chunk of timestamps um, stored in a single holdout set. Uh, another thing is that the data only looks at 24 hours in one day. I mean, would we start to capture more of a trend in hourly sentiment if we collected data over several days? How would you go about collecting more data? Um, so that's something else to think about. 
Uh, so what I would like you to do now is take on this challenge and further improve on this model. So if you've been given a head start, now I want you to take this example and improve on it. Sometimes we get into the habit of just uh, following along and copying what somebody else is doing, but I want you to, to think critically about this and think about some of the issues that we talked about and how you could take this further. To study time series further, you also need to understand things like model diagnostics, um, using the AIC to search for best model parameters. Um, you need to be able to handle any daytime data issues. Um, you might want to try other modeling techniques. So time series is um, something that we plan to introduce in Data Science Dojo's post bootcamp material, um, but you can learn more during a short sort of intense bootcamp. Uh, we cover some key machine learning algorithms and techniques, and we take you through the critical thinking process behind many data science tasks. You can check out the curriculum below this video, but keep fine tuning and keep practicing. Thanks for watching. If you found this video tutorial useful, give us a like, otherwise you can check out our other videos at Data Science Dojo Tutorials.